Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome all guests to this remote meeting of the council. I'd like to welcome members of the public and press who may be watching the meeting, which is being broadcast live on YouTube. Firstly, I wish to give a few announcements regarding this meeting. Please keep your microphones muted unless you're invited to speak, but please keep your cameras turned on. If you wish to speak during the meeting and in debates, please indicate by raising your physical hand so I can see you on video. Please remember that I can only see 25 members on my screen at any one time. We'll be moving between screens to see if any member raises their hands, but please be patient and please do not unmute yourself. When I call you to speak, I'll give you a few seconds to unmute yourself so you don't lose your speaking time due to any technological delays. If members lose their connection to the meeting, please call Janine Jenkinson in Democratic Services, whose contact number was sent to all members earlier today. We do have a very full agenda, so tonight I'll be very mindful of the time and length of debate. I will allow for each item. A meeting order paper which includes public and member questions and answers was published online this afternoon and also emailed directly to all members for those watching on YouTube. The full council agenda and supplementary can be accessed by the link on the YouTube page under show me. For voting, when moving recommendation and reports or a motion, the voting option will appear on each member's screen for 30 seconds. Once the electronic vote is being conducted, I will ask any member joining the meeting on the telephone how they intend to vote, and this will be added to those votes electronically cast. I'll then read the results for, against, and abstentions. Please note, the abstent figure read out will include members who did not select any of the voting options during the 30 second vote for whatever reason. Please note that a recorded vote will be taken when determining the budget item. Finally, if any member is leaving the meeting and not returning, please notify the chair by raising your hand or send a chat message to a chain mail. Meeting silence. A minute silence will be now held in the memory of those who have lost their lives due to the COVID pandemic. We have lost over 100,000 people, and unfortunately, the figure is growing every day. Please join me in a minute silence. Thank you. Item one, apologies for absence. I've received ap apologies for absence for this meeting, meeting from Councillors Pat Murphy, Lakmini Shah, Shaban, Shaban Mohammed, Tony Wilson, and Mohammed Ali for electness. Are there any other apologies of absence to be recorded? Anybody? Um, Chair, no apologies. I believe a number of people are still in the waiting room um, trying to get into the meeting. Okay, so thank you. Let me make sure that everybody's in. Please. I can, no one's in the waiting room. No one in the waiting room. There's no one in the waiting room. There's nobody in the waiting room. Thank you. 
No, on, on the WhatsApp message, sorry to, to interrupt. Um, there are a number of people who are saying they're trying to get in. Okay. Yep. Because it's the, we have two emails and the, I signed up as well to the first email and it was uh, they took they the, 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 the right ones. one. I only have Mohammed, Councillor yeah. Mohammed Ali for lateness. Okay, we'll, chair, yeah. chair, we'll, yes. we'll sort that out if we'll, we'll, we'll think we know the issue. Yeah, okay. So, All right, we know the issue. Thank you. I also have an apology of absence on behalf of the Chief Executive of the Al Bloodrick. I'd like to welcome Gita Subramanian Muni, the Council's Corporate Director for Brighter Futures, and Young Children and Young People's Commissioner, who is deputizing for her this evening. Item two, declarations of interest. Members are reminded that in accordance with section 106 of the Local Government Finance Act 1992, where any payment of council tax that is payable by a member has been outstanding for two months or more at the time of this meeting, the member must A, disclose the fact that they are in arrears, though they are not required to display the amount and cannot vote on any budget and council tax setting decisions in the report. Are there any members wishing to declare any disclosable pecuniary interest, other pecuniary or personal interest they may have in any matter which has to be considered this meeting? Anyone? Councillor Hudson still has his hand. Who has? Councillor Hudson. Councillor Hudson, what is it? I don't, I don't think he's Afterwards. declaring an interest. No, I don't think he's declaring an interest. And is just still up. Okay, thank you. Item 15 minutes. I move as a correct record the minute of the last ordinary meeting of the council held on 14 December 2020. Do I have a second, please? Chair, I do have a formal second. Is that agreed? Can you show hands, please? Is that agreed? The minutes of the last meeting? Thank you. I now move as a correct record the minutes of the extraordinary meeting of the council held on the 2nd February 2021. Do I have a second, please? Yes, Chair, I do have a. Uh, Is that agreed? Can I have a show of hands, please? Thank you. Item four. For our partners up there this evening, I'm pleased to welcome Professor Michael Mammoth, who is the director of the UCL Institute of Health Equity and is the leading voice in the study of health equity in the UK. In February last year, he revisited his landmark 2010 review on health equity in England revealing that 10 years on, people could expect to spend more of their lives in poorer health, and that the health gap between wealthy and deprived areas had widened. Since the COVID-19 crisis has brought this issue closer to public attention, Professor Michael Marmot has written on how we must build back fairer from the crisis. As we all know, our borough has been one of those disproportionately affected by this terrible virus. And so we thank you, Professor Mamos, for your work on this issue. We are delighted that you have taken the time to come and talk to us today. Professor Mamos, you have up to 10 minutes after which members will have to will have up to 10 minutes to ask any questions they might have. Professor Mamos. Thank you, Madam Chair. The I have two underlying oh, themes. Okay to what I want to talk about this evening. The first is an answer to the question that I get asked, is anyone listening to you? And related to that, the second is, assuming people do listen, what can we do? As the introduction said, I published my so-called Marmot Review in 2010, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, and we looked at the causes of health inequalities and identified six domains of recommendations of what you could do about it. Early child development, education and lifelong learning, 
employment and working conditions. The fourth was everyone in a rich society should have at least the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. The fifth was healthy and sustainable places in which to live and work. And the sixth was taking a social determinants approach to prevention. We looked at what had happened in the last 10 years in my report from February last year, Health Equity in England, the Marmot Review 10 years on, because we were concerned that at least at central government, and I'll come back to local government in a moment, at least at central government, there had not been enough activity. And what we showed in that report was very worrying. The increase in life expectancy that had been about one year every four years for 100 years in 2010-11, that slowed dramatically and just about ground to a halt. Second, as the chair said in her introduction, the inequalities in health got bigger. And th third, life expectancy for the poorest people outside London declined. Wow. Health stopped improving and the years spent in ill health increased. Inequalities increased. And third, for the poorest people outside London, health got worse. And we looked at the six domains that I had identified in 2010, and there was deterioration in most of them. So for example, child poverty went up. As you know, in London, housing costs contribute dramatically to child poverty. In London, it's something like 17% in, of children in poverty, where poverty is defined as less than 60% median income, before housing costs, 37% in poverty after housing costs. Child poverty went up. The spending on education went down by 8% per pupil. The rise of the gig economy when it comes to working conditions. And then number four, income. Well, there was a rise in poverty and the changes to the tax and benefit system was sharply regressive. The poorer the family, the worse the impact of changes to the tax and benefit system. So for families with children in the bottom 10% of household income, as a result of changes to the tax and benefit system, their income went down by 20% from 2010. And for the next 10%, it went down by about 14%. And then the richer they were, the less the impact. Now, there's a question of what local government can do when you've got regressive national policies. Well, now, as you know well, local government was hamstrung. If you look at the spending per person by local authorities in the least deprived, 20% of areas, the spending per person went down by 16%. And then the poorer the area, the greater the reduction. So in the most deprived 20%, spending per person went down by 32%. In my 2010 review, we coined the rather awkward term, proportionate universalism. We were in favor of universalist policies, but with effort proportionate to need. What I've just described in terms of funding of local government was effort inversely proportionate to need. The greater the deprivation, the greater the need, the greater the need, the greater the reduction in spending. And as you know well, we have a housing crisis. The proportion of families that was spending more than a third of their income on housing went up quite dramatically and the lower the income, the greater the increase. So all of these things have got worse. And that was all before the pandemic crashed upon us. 
It was predictable when the pandemic happened that it would reveal the underlying inequalities in society and amplify them. And that's indeed what happened. Let's look first at the inequalities in COVID-19 mortality. If you look at all-cause mortality, it follows a social gradient. The more deprived the area, the higher the mortality. And it's graded. It's not just that the poor areas have higher mortality. It's a graded phenomenon. COVID-19 mortality more or less exactly follows that gradient, which means the causes of inequalities in health more generally are the same set of causes that lead to inequalities in COVID-19. Now, there was some excess COVID-19 mortality in the three worst deciles in terms of deprivation. And we think that relates to employment in frontline occupations and living in overcrowded, possibly multi-generational households. The big surprise, because we had looked at mortality for different ethnic groups in my 10 years on report last February, and there was some excess, but with COVID-19, there was, as you know well, a huge excess in people that the ONS classifies as Black African, Black Caribbean, Bangladeshi, and Pakistani, to a lesser extent Indian, a big excess in mortality from COVID-19, much of which is related to geography, where people live, and other socioeconomic measures. Much of it, but not all of it. I was asked on the BBC when the ONS published these figures, following a minister who'd said people should wash their hands and practice social distancing. And I was asked, what did I think about that? I said, good advice. And we should deal with structural racism. Yes, but what should we do tomorrow? Tomorrow, we should start dealing with structural racism. Now, of course, the societal impact of the containment measures has been extreme. So the inequalities that we'd identified in February last year have been exaggerated. And that's why I called my December report, Build Back Fairer. We do not want to go back to the status quo that we had in February last year, because as I've described, that was far from ideal. We need to look at all of those domains, early childhood, education, the nature of working life, making sure that everybody in work receives a living wage and those who can't work receive a level of social benefit that enables them to lead a healthy life, dealing with the housing crisis in communities. So let me come back to the question, is anybody listening? People say, you must be very frustrated. You produce these reports and nothing happens. That's not true. After the publication in 2010, Coventry became a Marmot city. We've been working with Coventry and they took action across my six domains. Latterly, Greater Manchester talk about becoming a Marmot region. And we're working with Greater Manchester. We'll produce a report um, quite soon for Greater Manchester. Cheshire and Merseyside, Gateshead, all saying there's a lot we can do at local, city, even regional level. So yes, we want national government to act, but there's a lot we can do and it's happening. Is anyone listening? When we launched our Build Back Fair report at nine o'clock on a Tuesday morning, we had a webinar just before Christmas and 1,900 people tuned into the webinar. People are listening. The population is listening. People in healthcare are listening. People in local government are listening. Some 
national politicians are listening. And I think it's vital that local government take on this agenda, both to address what they can do locally, and thank you for the briefing document. I'm very impressed by the eight pillars that are priority for Newark. But also, local government can be an advocate for change at the national level. If we can support you in taking the steps that you want to take to build back fairer, I'm only so pleased to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mamot. Any members with any questions for Professor Mamot? Please raise your hands if you have any questions. Councillor Zulfika Ali. Thank you, Chair. And uh, can I thank Professor Michael Mahmoud for his uh, excellent presentation and a great deal of insight into work that uh, he's been doing in terms of identifying various determinants that uh, have disproportionately impacted on our communities. Um, as uh, Sir Keir Starmer, who quoted uh, your work in his speech, said recently that lives are becoming cheaper and shorter. And that is certainly the case. I think you highlighted that in your presentation as well as in, in your work that you've done. Neum has 73% of BAM community who have been affected really badly during the, the pandemic. Uh, and I think it's good to, to, to see that you acknowledge the, the work that we've been doing through Eight Pillar. And, uh, and certainly from the perspective of this, this, this uh, administration, we have done our best to make sure that we do not forget you know, the, the needs of our people. And despite difficult financial situation, we have maintained our, you know, I'm sure my colleague Sarah Rubens will say, you know, she led on the flagship Eat for Free scheme, which, which we have retained because of the benefits in terms of health and well-being, as well as the attainments of children. We support our uh, vulnerable residents. We, we've, we've paid the London living wage and we've uh, reviewed our procurement policies to ensure that we encourage future employers through community wealth building to do the same. Uh, and this is despite the fact the government hasn't increased our, our, our you know, public health grant, grant for many years. And even then, they just award it on an annual basis. But we now have 50 you know, steps in the right direction, working with our partners. So a lot is actually happening uh, in terms of tackling the issues of inequalities uh, and, and the, 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 the poor health issues of our people. We do have massive problems in terms of people with uh, uh, you know, the respiratory illnesses, heart conditions, diabetes, hypertension, and many more. So um, I'm sure you will agree that, you know, we, we uh, are, uh, you know, a fair way ahead in terms of tackling some of those issues at local level. Uh, what I would like to ask very quickly, is, uh, it's interesting that you, you made a link with uh, systemic racism and the other determinants, but you have also said that... Uh, the behaviors actually uh, aren't essentially. Ali, can I have your question, please? Yes, that is that is the question I'm asking, Chair. Yeah, that, yeah. I mean, that the, the question really that the, you know, Professor has uh, kind of said that the behavior isn't one of those uh, determinants as part of the the equation that he's looked at. I just like to hear some further thoughts in that regard because I thought behavior is is a, 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 an outcome of the social context and the environment that people live in. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mam, I mean, Professor Mamot, would you like to take three questions at a time or one at a time? Three at a time. Okay, thank you very much. John, Councillor John Gray. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And, and thank, thank you, Professor, for a really interesting presentation. Just to point out in Newham, the problem with child poverty of the housing costs is even worse. Some 66% of our children live in poverty uh, once their parents' housing costs are taken into account. And it, there is, I think, a wider political issue because where I would totally agree with your analysis, um, I, I, I just have concerns about how we're going to get there to achieve because for, you know, there's, uh, for too long this country, um, political, progressive political parties, and I'm not banging the Labour drum, have lost elections uh, because we are being you know, seen wrongly, in my view, as like tax and spend. However, 
there, was, there, was a, there is a problem that in this country we want to have like Scandinavian level of social services and welfare support, which would solve the issues you bring about. But at the same time, we want American style taxation levels. How do you think can we square this circle? Thank you, Councillor John Gray. I'm, I'm aware that this is a very passionate subject, but please, there's a lot of people who want to, to ask questions. So can we just stick to the point and just ask your questions, please? Councillor Muntas Khan. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Professor, thank you so much uh, for uh, your presentation. Um, I've been interested in your report uh, for some time, and I'll, I'll go straight to my um, question. I wanted uh, a bit more insight uh, into um, when we look at the Black and ethnic minority group who have been most affected, it appears that Bangladeshi and Pakistani community appear to be most affected. Uh, and I'd like some insight. Thank you. Professor Mahmoud, please. Do you want to answer the three questions, please? Yeah, thank you. Good questions. Uh, I didn't mention behavior. So we did actually, uh, with a couple of colleagues, publish a paper in the British Medical Journal a few weeks ago uh, talking about behaviours. But let me give you one illustration of the importance of putting behaviours exactly as you said, in context. We quoted data from the Food Foundation. For people in the bottom 10% of household income, if they followed their healthy eating advice, they would spend 74% of their income on food. So we can't just focus on the necessary behaviors, healthy eating, without focusing on the resources people need to be able them to enable them to eat healthily. So behaviors happen in a social context, exactly as you said. So they are vital, but we need to be careful of what we've called lifestyle drift, um, focusing on individual behaviors as if it's the individual's fault, rather than looking at the context that enables and drives those behaviors. On the question of uh, Scandinavian, Scandinavian types services and US taxes, if you ask somebody, would you like to pay more tax? They always say no. Um, so that's straightforward, that's pretty easy. I thought it was very interesting. I noticed a survey today from, I think Ipsos Mori, that the proportion of people who say the benefit levels are too low has been rising and now far it outstrips the proportion who say they're too high. That's a major change over the last decade that people are recognizing that we do need to make a change. I've been asked by senior politicians well, what can you tell us about how to engage the public? And my response was, I'm of an age where I recognize what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. And what I'm not good at is telling politicians how they should engage the public. Uh, but I can tell you what I do. I tell the truth, I show the evidence, and I engage the public, the people I talk to, in the conversation about what kind of society we want. What do we want for our children? What do we want for our grandparents? What do we want for ourselves? Do we want a society of the gig economy, of unaffordable housing, of children blight, whose lives are blighted by poverty? Is that the kind of society we want? So I think that's where we need to engage the discussion. Don't frame it, do we want tax and spend or do we want low taxes? What kind of society do we want? New and eight pillars, that should be the, the, the nature of the discussion. Um, in relation to the question about different ethnic groups, um, data are coming out all the time, but the, the last data from the Office for National Statistics that 
I looked at actually showed people they classify as black African had the highest mortality from COVID-19, then Bangladeshi, then black Caribbean, then Pakistani, and then India. I don't think we do know uh, precisely why um, those particular groups do, as, uh, do have high mortality. As I said, much of it is related to geography, which in turn is related to deprivation and other socioeconomic measures. Interestingly, for the Bangladeshi and Pakistani, prior ill health does make a contribution to the excess mortality. Not so, according to ONS, in Black African and Black Caribbean. But for Bangladeshi and Pakistani, prior ill health is important and is part of the story. And so in thinking, when I talked about structural racism, there's two kinds of questions, I think, maybe several. One kind of question is, why are people from particular ethnic groups more likely to be in positions of deprivation, more likely to be in frontline occupations, more likely to be living in overcrowded conditions? And then the other question is, what else is going on um, related to the ethnic group to which you belong? What else is going on that's driving these differences? And it's not just socioeconomic. There are other things going on as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Ali, stop. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wondered where you thought things like music and books and films and art come into uh, healthy living. Thank you. Councillor Tony McCallum. Just a question. Yeah. Um, professor, um, you mentioned in your presentation that racism has played a part and the impact, but can you um, emphasize a bit more how racism has played that part in the, um, in the coronavirus impacting on minority? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Professor, uh, for uh, the valuable work you have done and you are doing continuously. Um, inequality in every aspect of uh, BME community, health, education, income, housing, lifestyles, all linked. Uh, you have highlighted some very interesting uh, points. In Newham, we have witnessed high number of deaths in Bangladeshi and other BME community, but uh, in terms of vaccine, have they been prioritized? Not really. Um, I mean, we, we can identify issues, but how do we uh, make sure that from the top, they're listening. Yes, you have um, uh, asked a few times, um, anyone listening? And I am quite keen to get the answer. Is anyone listening? Thank you. Okay, well, Professor Mahmoud. Thank you for those three questions. Um, there's a new center about to be launched about uh, art, culture, and health. Uh, they're very much, I think I might have even written a preface for their report or something. They're very much on the view of um, that art and culture are good for health. I don't know the evidence on this, I have to say. Uh, I was very supportive of what they wanted to do. My own view, uh, I need to be a bit careful. Um, if I say that I organized the books in my study and I put away a thousand books. Uh, I gave 400 books to charity and moved another 400 into another room. Um, I, and I listened to opera streamed from the Metropolitan Opera House. I need to be very careful entering this territory. Um, the fact that books and music of a different, of particular sort are essential to my well-being, I need to, as I say, be very careful not to generalize that they're essential to everybody's well-being. That said, I think there are two aspects that are likely to be important. One is participation. 
Um, and that is likely to be important for everybody's well-being. Uh, to the extent that um, art and culture mean you're participating in whatever way it is, um, is likely to be important. And the second, and there's been a lot of debate, and I don't think there's a very clear literature on this. It relates to the debate about spirituality and health, um, of having some other dimension in your life. Very interesting speculation. Papers have been written on it. But as you can see, I'm quite careful about the evidence. And much as I'd like to say, yep, it's absolutely vital. I feel a bit shy of saying it, but I'm sure social participation is vital and participation in life's riches and meanings. Um, getting out of the drudgery has to be important. And if art and culture give you that, as does sport and physical activity, uh, that's likely to be important. And um, the second question was about racism and COVID, it was partly answered by Councillor Chaudhry in what she said, that you can see whether it comes to housing, education, uh, uh, employment, there are racist discriminatory elements to all of those. Now, I said that much of it, but not all of it, can be linked to deprivation and socioeconomic characteristics. The big challenge to that explanation is why do the doctors have a disproportionate mortality if they belong to particular ethnic groups? And I don't think we do know the answer to that question. Chan Nagpal, the chair of British Medical Association, has speculated that um, doctors from particular ethnic groups may find themselves deprived of personal protective equipment, may be more likely to be in exposed parts of the occupation and profession. I don't know if that's the answer, but it can't just all be deprivation. To some extent with the nurses, it can be, but not the doctors. They're not in the most deprived group, but they do have increased mortality. And that raises the question about discrimination. Thank you. Councillor Neil Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Um, very briefly, um, I don't know if we're running out of time, Chair, so I'll be very brief. Um, in terms of uh, the structures, um, colleagues have articulated far better than me the structural racism. But just on the structures of government, you mentioned the role local government can play like we can here, trying to influence central government. Would you agree that part of the issue has been this sort of... Um, dare I say, an ivory tower that the Department of Health has adopted vis-a-vis -vis even other government departments, let alone its interface with local government. I'm reminded that the Prime Minister the other week said it, it was dangerous to share data with local authorities in terms of a pandemic. He actually used the word dangerous. So I'm just wondering, you may not want to speculate on the party politics of it, but whether there's a culture within the Department of Health that I perceive, and whether you'd agree. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Susan Masters. Thanks, Councillor Laguda. Um, my question is a very quick one. On balance, has technology made healthier living easier or harder? Thank you, Councillor John Whitworth. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I would like to um, thank you, first of all, Professor, for your work which has done so much to improve our understanding of the relationship between material deprivation and health differences and um, in your presentation you mentioned the concept of uh, proportionate universalism which it seems to me is very important for authorities uh, like ours who want to provide services that are available to everybody while directing particular efforts towards those in the greatest needs. And I would like you perhaps to say a bit more on how you think uh, proportionate universalism best operates. We have had a case recently here um, where I think this, uh, this principle was involved when we had a discussion on the maintenance of our Eat for Free scheme. So I think it would be of interest to hear your views on this. 
Um, thank, thank you, you Professor Mahmoud. Well, on the structures of government, it, um, if you read my Build Back Fairer report, I asked the question, why did we have the worst health improvement of any rich country bar the United States leading up to the pandemic? So in the decade from 2010 to 2020, our slowdown was more marked than any rich country except the US and Iceland. And then we had the worst handling of the pandemic. We had the highest excess mortality of any country in Europe and higher than the United States. And I asked, what's the link between those two? And I speculated, you notice I try and make the difference when I'm talking from the evidence and when I'm speculating, but I speculated that the link between those two could work in four ways. The first was the quality of governance and political culture. And in part by quality of governance, I mean putting health and well-being at the heart of all government policy rather than whatever it is, um, fiscal austerity or uh, jobs for your friends or whatever it is, uh, working well with local government. So the quality of governance and political culture and certainly since the Brexit referendum up to the 2019 election, the country talked about nothing but Brexit. Did we talk about how to improve child development, how to improve education, how to improve communities, how to deal with the housing crisis? Was that part of the national discussion? We talked about nothing but Brexit, which was the most distressing conversation imaginable. So I think the quality of governance and political culture, and then the handling. And as you said, I'm not making a party political point. I don't think anybody, whatever political party you belong to, can look at the way Britain handled the pandemic and say, well done, or agree that we did everything that was humanly possible. I don't think anybody could agree with that, whatever your political party. The second was the growth of social and economic inequalities. The third was the disinvestment in public services. I described the regressive nature of the cuts to local government, the starving of funds for the National Health Service. And the fourth was we weren't very healthy. So I think all of those uh, do start to link our poor health record coming into the pandemic and what happened during the pandemic. On the question, uh, very, it was a short question, but it could be a longer answer. On balance, has technology been good or bad for us? I invite you, if you can find it, to watch a video from the late Hans Rosling, the Swedish um, epidemiologist, statistician. And he describes when his grandmother got a washing machine and she sat and watched this washing machine. She just sat and looked at it as the washing went round and round and thought about what it had been like to do the washing by hand before she had her washing machine. And then Hans Rosling reaches into this washing machine and pulls out a book. He said, my grandmother had time to read because she no longer had to work all day doing the washing. On balance, when you think of the misery and the drudgery, and it was particularly women who suffered that misery and drudgery of getting through the day, on balance, technology be, has been the most amazing boon. That doesn't mean there's a downside. There is, of course, a downside. And one of the big downsides is destruction of jobs, the very thing that made women's lives livable because they were no longer subject to this slave labor of being bound to these domestic chores, the very things that made women's lives livable destroyed jobs. So on balance, technology has been wonderful. I'm looking at everybody I can see and they're all looking at their laptops and their iPads. I wish they were listening to me, but never mind. They're all looking at their technology. We couldn't do this this evening without the technology. So it's been a most amazing boon. Um, but the question is, who's to be master?
who's to be master and how we, that's part of building back fairer. Uh, how do we handle the technology? Um, and this is quite apart from Facebook and Twitter and Google uh, ruling our lives, which they do, and dominating politics, which they do. Um, the question is who's to be master? So technology has been an undoubted boom, but we have to control it and keep it in check. On proportionate universalism, uh, the more examples I can find, the better. Um, I saw recently, I think last week, some evidence on um, the grant, a maternity grant, uh, which was a universal benefit. And then when it got canceled, um, there was a noticeable decrement in birth weight, but it affected poorer women more. So it's not quite proportionate universalism, it's close, but it shows that a universal benefit can be good, but poorer women needed it more and they probably needed more help. Now, we need to be careful because in general, I think means tested benefits are less desirable than universal benefits. So when we say effort proportionate to need, uh, I'm not proposing that we start means testing and labeling people as in great need and everybody else isn't. The whole principle of universality is you don't do that. But the NHS is a perfect example of proportionate universalism. It's a universal service available to everybody. But if you've got diabetes, and peripheral vascular disease and hypertension and chronic renal disease and eye problems and then cardiovascular disease, the NHS spends a lot of money on you. Uh, most of us would probably be quite happy if the NHS never spent a penny on us. We wouldn't feel cheated. We'd say that's great because it means we didn't need it. We're healthy. So the NHS is a perfect example of proportionate universalism. Uh, it's not proportionate to deprivation, but it is proportionate to need. A universalist service available to everybody, free at the point of use, but the expenditure and the effort is proportionate to people's needs. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Councillor Delphi Tahula. Unmute yourself, please. Sorry, yes. Thank you, Mr. Marmot. Earlier in your introduction, uh, you talked about um, um, the rates of um, uh, BME communities, um, you know, the, the dying, especially Black Africans uh, during the COVID. Um, we noticed that yet these communities, especially the Black community, Black Africans, they, they have the lowest rates of vaccination. Um, Yet, he explained that. Okay, I've only got two more questions plus my own. Councillor Joshua Garfield, that's thank the you. last three questions I'm going to take now. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for that presentation, Professor. What a very quick question. I wondered, in your professional opinion, what is the single greatest tool that you think local authorities in the UK have at their disposal to tackle many of the health inequalities that you've highlighted? Uh, Councillor Firoza Nekwala. Thank you, Professor, for your contribution this evening. In your presentation, you mentioned creating a sustaining, healthy and sustainable places and communities as a recommendation. Would you agree breathing toxic, dirty air contributes to inequalities? Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Professor Mike, and I'm going to give you four questions with my own, which is yes. the last one. What advice do you have for and the help and support can you give a vara like ours who have got all the inequalities you've mentioned? Um, well, thank you. Uh, these have been terrific questions, I have to say. Excellent questions. I made a note of them because uh, I'm not 
totally satisfied with all my answers, as you can tell when I've said, I don't know. So um, I think it was a positive mood and somebody asked me earlier, I didn't address the vaccination question. I think it was a positive move when the government included deprivation and ethnic status, ethnic group as putting people up the priority list to get the vaccination. I think that's a positive move. I mean, initially, when the vaccination started to be rolled out, I was all in favor of it going to healthcare people and to older people. And it's, that seemed to me right. But now, as the NHS, bless them, have made such a success of rolling out the vaccination, wow, that's terrific. And that means we need to rush, and we are, we're doing brilliantly well, um, and making sure that people living in deprivation and um, people from different ethnic groups are included. And then there's a big issue about vaccine hesitancy. And uh, you mentioned amongst black African um, and when people like Kevin Fenton, who's a head of uh, Public Health England in, in London, uh, himself of Afro-Caribbean origin, speaks out about how important it is um, for black people to get the vaccine. When uh, counselors on this call, uh, if you speak out about how important it is for people from your communities to get the vaccine, I think that's of vital importance. Uh, I mean, when being somebody of an age group that I was in the, whatever it was, not the top, but second or third priority, uh, when I got my invitation, I didn't hesitate. The, within minutes of getting the invitation, I booked my, uh, booked my slot to get my vaccination. I was in no doubt. So uh, if I'm in no doubt and, you, you've heard that when I am in doubt, I say I'm in doubt when I can't answer a question, but I'm in no doubt that it's beneficial. So we need to get everybody we can um, to get the message across that by getting vaccinated, not only are you helping yourself, but you're helping your community, you're helping others. So you do it for personal benefit and you do it as part of your contribution to the community. So. I understand vaccine hesitancy. I understand why people are suspicious of authority and the like, but that's why it's vital that members of the community actually speak out and say how important it is. The question, if I understood you, the second question about, uh, in a sense, what levers do local authority have um, that can they can act? What I think I learned from Coventry, when Coventry declared itself a Marmot city, is, uh, and indeed in my discussions with local government, it's really interesting that whereas the political party to which you belong really matters in Westminster, in my experience, it matters a bit less at local government because what local government has is experience of the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work and age, what we describe as the social determinants of health. What, what local government has that's really special that central government tends not to have is a real understanding of the conditions in which people live their lives, how they try to raise their children, live lives, have meaningful lives. And that means that the services can be tailored to local needs. Uh, the, the downside, of course, is all the money comes from central government, or in the case of local government, doesn't come from central government, is starved uh, at the center. But that's where the advocacy role comes in. And I think that's why the difference, I, I mean, I, I found it interesting meeting successive conservative chairs of the local government association are really angry with central government at the lack of funding for local government. They recognize the damage it does. And they're Tories. 
So you don't have to be on the other side politically to recognize the damage that the lack of funds from central government is doing. But I think what you really have at local government is a real understanding of your community, which is not present in the center. The question of toxic air, absolutely. I mean, we know, and now I'm on safer ground with the evidence, look in London. If you look at the level of deprivation and then look at the schools, schools that are in more deprived areas are more exposed to oxides of nitrogen and PM 2.5. The more deprived the area, the greater the PM 2.5, the soot particulate matter exposure. So it's a contributor to inequalities in health. And the idea that we're sending our children to schools that are surrounded by toxic air it is a terrible idea. So toxic air, uh, dealing with it, uh, has got to be right, not just in general, but because of the contribution it makes to inequalities, and particularly inequalities in children. And the other side of it is that given how much of pollution now comes from transport, from cars, reducing pollution will be a contributor to net, greenhouse, net zero greenhouse gas emissions. It will actually be dealing with the climate crisis at the same time as it's dealing with the pollution problem. So, uh, and when we saw blue skies with the first lockdown and no traffic and heard the birds sing, many of us said, isn't that wonderful? And Madam Chair, to come to your question, it's the key question. Um, we would be delighted to work with you um, if we can advise in some way, where, as I said, we're working with other local governments, uh, local authorities, and we're also in conversations with the East London Foundation Trust about what they can do. And of course, your borough of Newham uh, is part of the patch that they serve. And the idea that despite the poor settlement, financial settlement from the center, you can try and deal with your eight pillars um, and we could potentially help you uh, with the way you deal with those eight pillars. Uh, we'd be, be delighted to do it. And if that's an outcome of my, um, I can smell my chicken in the oven that I have got to take out of burning the chicken. Well, it was worthwhile. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. We know that you are an extremely busy person and we have appreciated you giving up your time to speak with us tonight. You are, of course, welcome to stay, but come to fully understand if you wish to leave, you could. Thank you very much once again. That was very interesting. Can we show appreciation to Professor Mahmoud, please? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, colleagues, for such good that questions. That was a very nice debate. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Wow. <laughs> Item five. It's announcements by me. As Chair of Council, I'd like to take this opportunity to put on record my own gratitude and thanks on behalf of the whole Council to all the volunteers NHS workers, health and care workers, faith groups, community leaders, police and council officers, te and teachers who have worked so hard to support new residents in the last year during this terrible COVID pandemic. It has been a very difficult time, especially in New York. And the whole council has come together with all its partners to distribute food, parcels, and prescriptions and co vulnerable residents through Help New York to help set up testing sites and ensure people can isolate safely in their homes and in delivering the vaccines in recent months. It has truly shown the community spirit in the council amongst the people of New York and throughout our local partners. And for that, I'd like to pay tribute. Thank you. And happy St. David's Day to everyone. I think it's almost finished, but it's still there. There's still a few more hours. Thank you. Item six.
Any announcement by the mayor? Can I ask the mayor if she has any announcements, please? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yes, I do have an announcement. Uh, and uh, if I may, I'll start it now. So my thanks to you, Chair uh, Joy Laguda, and good evening, colleagues, and welcome to all those residents or members of the public watching tonight's meeting. I wanted to start by thanking Professor Marmot for his brilliant insights and the crucial contribution he is making to the alternative approaches and strategies we so vitally need in the face of COVID-19 amplifying the case for a fairer society and for healthy lives and the urgency that we build back fairer in response, not least because of the deeply entrenched inequality that COVID-19 ruptures into the open with devastating effect. I know that he's gone to check on his chicken, but if he was here, I was going to say, Professor Marmont, thank you. And to reassure you, we have been listening to you. And since May 2018, we've already been putting in place his call to action for fairer society through our community wealth building and inclusive economy strategies. Moreover, through our recent Towards a Better New Recovery Action Plan that will drive forward the build back fairer demand you rightly make. As well as supporting people through these difficult times, we are placing the health, well being, and happiness of our residents as a primary measure of our success. And absolutely, we are listening. And we'd be privileged to work in with you and your team by becoming a Marmont Borough to address health inequities and by eradicating the social determinants. If not now, when? If not now, how do we then answer the urgent demand for hope? Professor Marmont's work has highlighted the importance of fair pay in reducing health inequalities because decent wages is a significant instrument in addressing poverty by giving people the resources they need to lead healthy lives. So colleagues and residents watching tonight in honor of Professor Marmont's work, I am pleased to announce that we have officially received accreditation from the Living Wage Foundation as a London Living Wage Borough. Two years and 11 months since this administration came into being and since I stepped into office as mayor, the London Borough of Newham is a London Living Wage Borough now progress with the people and for the people always. Becoming a London Living Wage Borough means that as well as the council paying the London Living Wage to all of its staff, and we are the largest employer locally, we will push all of our suppliers and council owned businesses to do the same. They must do the same. Becoming a accredited London Living Wage Borough is an important landmark both real and symbolic, of the kind of council we are. We are an activist and campaigning council focused on improving the life chances and outcomes of all of our residents, as well as addressing poverty and inequality in ways that contrast sharply with dominant approaches that have been long pursued. Officially becoming a London Living Wage Council means that the wages of some of our most valuable workers in essential and critical frontline services will be raised. And we have championed policies to improve living standards since day one. And an early step was to pay our own care, home care workers the London living wage, making a difference to those mainly women workers and acknowledging the vital work that they do. You all know that I was horrified a couple of years back when our own research team as part of our community wealth building development revealed that some 36,000 new jobs that's the jobs of some 27% of those in work in the borough were not even being paid the legally required national minimum wage, let alone the London living wage. The figure is even higher amongst women and those from black, Asian and ethnic minority communities, a reminder of the endemic structural racism and exploitation in the labour market that is obscene. We are a borough with large numbers of people in low paid and insecure work and vulnerable to such exploitation. And the impact of COVID-19 has deepened economic hardship. I know we have the highest furlough levels in London at 33,000 people and unemployment has increased by 240%. Presently, we have 27,000 people in Newham relying on benefits for some or all of their income, many in low paid work. In February last year, before the start of the pandemic, that figure was 12,000. 
So fundamental change has always been needed in Newham. And that's why the London living wage is an absolute minimum that we will be demanding, that I will be demanding for our people. I'm especially proud of the steps that we took way back with regards to those care workers, but also to pay all young people who apply for our apprenticeships here in the council. And we offer them the London living wage, something that goes way beyond the requirements for the London, uh, the London living wage accreditation. And uh, for all those businesses, please be under no illusion. We will be bringing full pressure and encouragement to all local businesses uh, to embrace the London living wage. Our community wealth building pledge, which we announced earlier this year, for example, requires that those who sign up must pay the London living wage here in Newham. Why? Well, we have long argued for the London living wage as a means of support for workers, but also an opportunity for businesses. The evidence is clear that paying and treating workers decently is in the interests of everyone. The Living Wage Foundation's own research shows that 80% of employers felt that it has enhanced the quality of work, reduced absenteeism, made people feel more positive and improved mental well-being. And of course, in light of the past 11 months coming up to a year soon, COVID has shown how economic and health issues are completely connected. In fact, we have evidence that job insecurity has actively undermined efforts to defeat the virus. Our health team, working flat out to build up mass testing to identify and isolate the virus, have found that the greatest factor preventing people from isolating is fear of losing a job and pay. Alarmingly, our research found that 76% of those that talked were fearful uh, uh, in this way. No one should have to choose between putting food on the table and keeping safe. And it's horrifying, but it reflects the consequences of the systematic erosion of employment rights over a very long period in this country. So redressing the balance is vital and the London living wage is a crucial step. And we intend to go much further. As part of our new our Newham service launched last month, we will have a dedicated employment rights hub so that people have somewhere to turn to for advocacy, advice and support. We want to improve pay and rights and working conditions across the borough for all of our working residents, reflecting my role as the Mayor of Newham to fight uh, their corner every day and every night. We will build on all of those basic human rights as a baseline to build our local economy on equality, on better pay, on sustainable jobs for the future, and a hard wire fairness into what we do. So colleagues, I'm delighted to announce that we have finally achieved formally, officially, the London Living Wage accreditation here uh, at Newham Council, and we are now a London Living Wage uh, Council. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. Item seven, any announcement by the acting chief exec? And I have no acting chief executive, she has an announcement, please. I have no announcements, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Item eight, any, uh, any updates by cabinet members? Is there any member of cabinet who wishes to update the council? Who will be allowed to speak for, on, for up to three minutes? No. Okay, no, thank you. Item nine. It's nice to be back. I think it's quite wearisome. Sorry? Somebody say something. Somebody say something. Where is it? I was thinking it's just in the bed. Okay. <laughs> Uh, you never told me about your history with Snow's mother. Chair, I reserve my um, comments and my five minutes for item 16. Exactly. No, we're not on Okay, thank you. Somebody else is saying something. I can't. I think somebody's not on mute. Somebody's not on mute. Can everybody mute yourselves, please? Because it's actually causing me some. Thank you for writing this. Thank you. I think it's Councillor McCallum. Yeah, I so said you speak later. No, that's where the noise is coming. Oh, I see. Okay. Item 10, deputations. There are no deputations this evening. 
item 11, petitions. Does any member have a petition they wish to present to the council? Possibly Councillor Kitchen. Councillor Kitchen, do you have a petition? Uh, yes, thank you, um, Councillor Guda. I have a petition on behalf of residents from Strongdon Walk um, calling for CCTV and implementing the findings of the feasibility study. It's in line with um, um, evidence that's also been submitted by the police and it's to um, Councillor Beckles. Okay, thank you. Please ensure democratic services resolve the petition to pass on to the relevant director for consideration. Thank you, Councillor Kitchen. Members, questions? Joy, I also have a, a petition. Oh, have you got another one? Sorry. That's okay, don't Lewis. worry. So, have you got uh, a petition? Yes, I do, count, uh, Chair. I have a petition submitted by the residents of Stansfield uh, Road, Fulmer Road, and Partridge Close. Um, requesting CCTV in their area based on evidence they have collected and submitted to the police, in, resulting in the increase in crime and antisocial behaviour. Okay, thank you. Please ensure democratic services receive the petitions to pass on to the relevant director for consideration. I'm sorry about that. I didn't uh, see your hand. Sorry. Don't worry, Joy. Okay. <laughs> Item 12, members' questions. There's one question from members this evening. The question put and the question put and answer given are listed in the other paper. Councillor Masters, do you have a supplementary question based on the answer received in relation to your question? Uh, I do, Chair. Uh, while I'd like to thank Councillor Asa and his team for a comprehensive answer and for providing evidence of impact elsewhere. My question specifically requested targets for our borough, for Newham. And my concern is that in having to go to two wealthier boroughs for his answer, without extrapolating how this might feed down to the streets of East and West Ham, he's merely underlining the fear in many quarters that we're requesting a change many of our residents aren't able to make in the eye of a pandemic storm. Given that many of our residents require a car to deliver caring responsibilities, be enabled around a disability or apply a trade, will there be any safety net should evidence prove that far from making us greener, uh, the emissions-based parking model is actually depriving our residents of much needed mobility and connectivity? Uh, and perhaps a rethinking of our approach should that be the case? Councillor Asa, would you like to respond, please? Yes, happy to, Chair. Uh, thank you for, you, for, for notice of your question, Councillor Masters. And um, obviously, we tried to give you as much detail as possible. I think one of the, the issues around, um, just to go into the detail of the original question, is that when you're tackling air quality, one of the things we have to do is tackle it on a multitude of levels, and therefore it becomes very difficult to pin down to say that one specific issue is, is, is reducing it. It's a combination of stuff. I take the point in the supplementary question about um, the importance of monitoring and the importance of understanding how the policy is working, and certainly that's something we'll be doing over the coming year. One of the things, and beyond, because I think one of the things we have to look at is both in terms of monitoring the air quality, which we will be doing, and we'll be looking at where we can identify impacts, but also looking at the impact of the policy. We've identified a couple of areas where this policy has been in place and the impacts there. There are others too, and I've spoken to counterparts in neighbouring boroughs who have followed a similar measure. It's worth saying that um, two thirds of London boroughs have now adopted this policy, including 17 of the 22 Labour councils and more will be following. Um, and so therefore we will be monitoring this and looking at its impact across the board. And so we can stay on top of it. I think, as we heard from Professor Marmot, you know, we know that air quality has a significant impact on deprived areas of boroughs, which is why it's been such a uh, priority for us. But um, we'll certainly monitor it and we'll certainly be taking feedback. And I'm sure backbench councillors and plump benchers and across the board will be delivering um, messages in terms of the impact they're getting from, from their residents and their feedback, as indeed they, they already have and already do. And we will certainly take that into account. 
I would say, and I use this opportunity to, to flag to, to council, I think we are likely to see, particularly post the uh, mayoral elections in May, um, further targets for local government, and particularly by the end of the year when we have the climate change conference, that further targets coming through that local government are going to face. So I think this is going to be an issue that will be a particular debating point, not just locally, but nationally and internationally too. And I, I think we're going to have to continue to monitor our policies to make sure we're, we're meeting the targets we're likely to be set. But the specific point Councillor Masters makes about monitoring, it will be, of course, hugely important in terms of making sure policies are effective and doing what they say to do and where we need to make mitigation. We obviously made mitigation this year in regards to the pandemic, both in terms of the 40% discount we provided, which we have now rolled out, and also the three month and six month permits. Um, further work we carry on that to look at other mitigating measures in terms of whether we can make that shorter too. So I, I know um, people will continue to feedback the detail, and I know Councillor Masters will, will be on top of this as well. Thank you, Councillor Jeff Sasa. Item 30 Questions by the public. We have received 12 questions from members of the public. The questions submitted and the answers are those which appear in tonight's order paper. The answers will be emailed to the questionnaires and will appear in the minutes of this meeting. Since members of the public are watching the meet meeting on YouTube but not present at the meeting, I'll simply ask if any member of the cabinet has anything further to add to their answer already published in the order paper. Any cabinet member wishing to say anything else? On the answers they have sent to the, uh, Terry to the public? Can you go back? Terry Paul. Oh, Councillor Terry Paul. Thank you, Chair. It's just to come back on, on the question, which I think from Member of the Public, Andrew Bakey, regarding a, a sale of an asset. I'd just like to reassure members, but obviously a couple of years ago, SITFA came in to Newham and looked at our investments and ruled, but some of our investments, let, how can I put it, were sitting outside normal established guidelines. Um, I can assure members, but we haven't um, sold this asset to restore our revenue position. What we've did, we took a commercial look at this asset in order to mitigate and reduce the risk to Newham of our investment portfolio. So I can assure members, this is an example of us following the sit for guidelines, improving our governance and providing assurance to residents, but no longer will we use our resources for um, speculation in the uh, in the market. Thank you, Councillor Terry. For any other cabinet member? Okay, thank you very much. Item 14, speeches from members. There are no speeches from members this evening. Item 15, motions. There are no motions this evening. Item 16, the council's budget and council tax setting proposals 2020 to 2021 to 2022 to 2023. We have before us a report on the mayor's proposed budget for the period 2020 to 2021 to 2022 to 2023 and council tax setting proposals. Councillor Paul, please move the recommended, uh, sorry, move the recommendation in the report. You have up to five minutes. Thank, thank you, Chair, and good evening residents who are watching this via YouTube, and good evening everyone here tonight in this meeting. Officially, this report is called News Budget Recovery, Reorientation and Hope. But actually, it's a budget for our residents, and it provides the means for us to provide the help which our residents need, and it shows, more importantly, we care. Residents have been hit hardest by the pandemic. We've heard a tour de force by Professor Marmont today about some of the impact of the pandemic and some of the challenges which local government are, are ideally there to solve. The pandemic has, has come on the back of sustained government imposed austerity and reductions in our funding arrangements. However, the budget which is before us is about affordable homes. It is about tackling homelessness. It's about looking after our vulnerable residents. 
And also it's about looking after primary school children. And I will say the backdrop to this budget is long-term government cuts in our funding, savage cuts by, a, happens to be a conservative government. And more importantly, we've been shortchanged by the government because of COVID. Professor Marmont said something, he said, where you have the greatest need, you need to spend the most. He said that in his words. And the government has not provided the resources we require to look after our residents. And this budget goes some way for us to look after our residents. The budget report in, set in front of you sets up our proposals for 20, year 22 and 21, 22 towards 23 and 20, 22 and 23. And it reflects the priorities of the mayor, of the cabinet and of this council. We've heard today about the, uh, us becoming a living wage, a, a lovely living wage accredited borough. And it shows that we do care about our residents. And these proposals presented tonight are actually built upon our first two budgets as an administration. The first budget in 2019 was about providing stability for our residents. It was called the People's Budget. Last year, on the 2nd of March, for the first time in, let's call it, living recorded history, we put together a three-year medium-term budget, which, despite all our challenges, put our finances on a firm footing. And it also included investment for services to protect and provide for our residents. This March, and that budget last year, put together a, a, because of government austerity, £42 million pounds worth of cuts, but also, more importantly, put together a sustainable package for growth and investment, and for example, into our young people, which is very important. But we're talking about COVID. At the time of publication, COVID had cost us £82 million. Pounds. The government has provided only 62 at the time of this report. I remember there is a gap. The government said to local authorities like ours, do what you have to do to protect your residents. And they didn't. They left us alone. They didn't meet our needs. And it gets worse. In December, the government produced a one-year financial settlement. Local authorities like us, in order to do the things we need to do, we need to plan. That's what you would expect as residents for us to plan for the longer term, to ensure our residents are protected. But the government hasn't done that. It provided a one year settlement. It hasn't provided the sums we need to provide for our residents and protect against COVID. And because of that, there is a gap. The gap we have to find is 12 million. And what we will do, there is a sustainable plan in our budget book about how over the term we're going to use our reserve for this, let's call it a rainy day event. And what we will do is replenish those reserve over the next three year period. In order to do that, there is a proposal to increase our council tax to 4.99%. And I'll just to reassure residents, 3% of that council tax increase is can only be spent for adult social care. It will only be spent to protect our residents. And remember, COVID has hit us hard. Lots of our residents are living with long COVID, the impact of, the impact of COVID, you know, respiratory mobility problems. Those residents need our support to protect them in the longer term. And that provides us the money we need to provide for our residents. Also, more importantly, there is an additional sum of money, £300,000, to provide for a COVID relief scheme. It provides that assurance and comfort to our residents that will be there in these tough times to protect them. But I also want to remind residents listening here tonight what also what we've done. The Mayor has talked about the love the living wage. We've been on that journey for a couple of years now. Tonight is great. We've been accredited. We've, we've kept our libraries open. We've to put six million pounds into providing school meals for our children. And we are there investing in our young people. We have some of the lowest council tax in London and in Northeast London.
but we have some of the highest need for our residents. There is an imbalance in our financial resources. Government austerity has cost this local authority approximately 200 million pounds in over the last 11 years. It has taken money directly out from our ability to help our residents. What I will say to residents here, COVID is here with us. And what we have to do is live, is learn to live with the concept of uncertainty. We know COVID is not going to go away. We know the economy is not very good, but we still got to stand by and protect our residents. And in that, and in terms of that transparency, set out in the budget book is a list of the saves that we need to make and a list of the challenging savings. Just want to say to residents listening, yes, we are putting the council tax up by a small amount and for a band C property Newham, that's three pounds 89 per month. But also what we've done, we've continued to invest in our council tax reduction scheme. Let me explain what that is. Those families who are finding it tough and they're vulnerable and they can't pay their council tax, up to 90% of their council tax will be paid by this local authority and there's a fund to support those residents. And that's what we are continuing to do in these tough times. We actually put more money into that scheme in our first year of office. So we are protecting our residents. We are supporting our, our households. You've got 20 seconds, Councillor Paul. Thank you. So we have to deal with the uncertainty of the pandemic, government austerity and the, pan and the uncertain nature. I'd like to thank my finance team uh, for helping in doing this, especially Conrad Hall, Andrew Ward, Dave McNamara and Ms Rahman. And through you, Chair, I'd like to invite the Cabinet Member for Brighter Futures, Carleen Lee Parkway, to second the budget tonight. And also, as appropriate for you, Chair, there might be other Cabinet Members who like to add enumeration and to highlight some of the things in the budget with regards to their area. Thank you, Chair, and I commend this budget to full Council and to the residents of Newham. You do have a second up, Councillor Carlin, Parker. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to second this budget this evening. It's an immense pleasure to be able to second the, this year's budget. This year's budget comes at a time of great uncertainty for the country and also for our residents here in Newham. As the Cabinet Member for Brighter Futures, I am proud of all the work that is being done in Newham to ensure that our young people are able to realise their full potential. Since 2018, this administration has consistently invested more into the provision of services for our young people. As a daughter of Newham, being someone who has lived in this borough my whole life, seeing the progress that is being made in so many areas that directly affects the lives of our residents is truly heartwarming. Our aim is for Newham to be the best place for a child to grow up. But what does this actually mean? It means that no child in Newham, irrespective of their family circumstance, should be held back. Every young person should have the equality of opportunity. We are seeking to empower and therefore elevate our most vulnerable and disadvantaged young people. Many times as politicians, we are used to hearing figure after figure and reading the budget book, but behind every figure, there is a story. So take Darren, I have changed the young person's name to protect his identity. Darren has used our services for the past 18 months. Darren was on the verge of being excluded and his parents couldn't cope with his deteriorating behavior. Our wonderful intervention workers were able to work with Darren and his family, providing much needed support and assistance. Darren is now on track to attend university and his life has taken a completely different path to the one he was heading down. So colleagues, you made that possible through the successive budgets we have passed and the aspirational nature of the mayor and the administration. So today I urge you to vote for this budget and let's continue to change the lives of our young people for the better. I would like to formally second this budget. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Callan. Uh, 
And I call Councillor McCalmont as chair of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Do you wish to speak on the Overview and Scrutiny Committee's budget working party report and cabinet response to the recommendations? Yes, Chair, and thank you. Chair, I make this statement on behalf of Scrutiny in response to the London Bar of Neum budget report. The budget working party report as containing this council agenda is a consensus report which my colleague and I have unanimously produced. This is the second budget of a three years medium term budget strategy of the Mayor Fias administration. The budget proposal reflects the priorities of our administration and are identified in the corporate plan and where applicable revised in light of the coronavirus pandemic. Not only has the coronavirus pandemic had a negative impact on already stretched budgets, it has also brought to the forefront the historical web of inequalities, racism, poverty, and the deeply uneven out health outcomes, which when taken together as the pandemic impact the minorities in a severely and profoundly disproportionate way. The national context remained one of continued austerity for local government. With ever diminishing central government grants, Newham has had about 50% cut in its share of central government grants since 2010, which resulted in cuts and savings by Newham Council for, of nearly 200 million over the same period. This year's grant position is 123 million pounds. This year's budget is set amidst the backdrop of the coronavirus pandemic, which has cost the council 12 million pounds more than the 68 million pounds central government has provided. Madam Chair, in an attempt to be constructive, I should like to acknowledge the following. The Council has made some inroads in addressing food insecurity by way of a 3.5 million spend. The retention of the Eat for Free to the order of 6 million, which will go some way to addressing food poverty for some of our barrister children. Extra investment in our young people's future, keeping libraries open despite the financial squeeze on the revenue budget. And lastly, I acknowledge that 74% of our residents are paying between 725 and, eight, and 982 pounds in council tax. However, it will be a miss of my role if I do not highlight certain areas of concern to the budget working party. Firstly though, let me say that the general approach taken by the budget working party during this session include exploring with the executive the following broad key lines of inquiries. One, financial breakdown on departmental budgets. Two, key assumption underlying departmental budgets. Three, areas a mark for savings or efficiency and the associated rationale for these, four areas of slippage, and five areas of risk and mitigating action, to name a few. By doing this, we amass a body of evidence which give fruit to a suite of recommendations contained in the report, some of a purely budgetary nature and others in an operational context. However, all share in the spirit of accountability and in wanting to play a constructive and collaborative role in collectively shaping Neurom's budget and supporting the delivery of the proposed savings. The budget for 2021-22 is set at 264 million pounds with a built-in savings complement of 12 million that must be achieved to remain balanced throughout the year. Madam Chair, the Budget Working Party believe that there is a risk inherent in the extent to which we depend on achieving savings to balance this and future budget. The Budget Working Party is minded to consider 
that the pandemic has in some ways impacted on some departmental department's ability to achieve their savings proposal, their savings. Notwithstanding, we remain concerned about the revenue budget savings slippages, especially in service areas where they are reacquiring overspends. The 2020-21 revenue budget is projecting a 9 million overspend, which will reduce the general fund reserve by the same amount. We are ultimately concerned about the reduction, but I've heard the section 151 officers reassurance in this regard, just as one minute left. we heard our concern. Madam Chair, our recommendation are offered as an aid to the administration and as an additional way to achieve a balanced budget overall. They also serve as a way for us to monitor the budget. And I sincerely believe that they will support the achievement of the administration strategic objective if taken on board. I commend the budget party working the budget party's report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor McCalmont. Now we move to the debate. Does any member wish to speak? Please raise your hand so we can see you clearly. Councillor Zulfika Ali. Thank you very much, Chair, and I'm grateful uh, to you for allowing me to say a few words uh, this evening. Chair, clearly this has been a very difficult time for our, the council as well as our residents due to the, the COVID pandemic. And Councillor Paul has already highlighted the impact of austerity, government's failure to fund local government adequately, and of course, not to deliver on its promise to reimburse the council on COVID costs. I don't know where the promise of spend, spend, spend has disappeared. In terms of my own department, Chair, the adult social care, the services have been underfunded across the country for many years. I mean, when Boris Johnson became prime minister in his first speech that he said he will sort this out as soon as he gets into the office. But unfortunately, he's done nothing at all. And as Professor Mahmoud said earlier this evening, all he's done is wasted his time on politics of Brexit rather than actually delivering services to local people. So the even government select committee recognized the need for additional four billion pound investment, which is needed to enable local authorities to continue to deliver these services against the rising demands. And can I say, Chair, that you know, the, the social care budget in this council is in excess of 90 million pound gross, which is being spent you know, to meet the needs of our vulnerable residents. And I'm grateful to the council and administration that this has been recognized for the benefit of residents because we don't want to let them down. So what has the government done, Chair? Rather than providing additional funding, the government has placed the burden on the council to fund additional social care costs. And that is by saying you can increase, as council Paul said already, the council tax by 3%. This is an easy option for this government who has consistently failed to adequately fund much needed services that we, our residents expect and deserve from a central government right now. Instead, they pass the burden back to local taxpayers by leaving us with no choice. Nobody wanted to, wants to increase council tax, Chair. I'm sure we all agree, and I, that's what people will be expecting as well. But this government has left us with no choice but to inc increase the council tax so that we can continue to fund much needed social services. Chair, we serve more than 4,500 vulnerable residents in this borough who rely on us and have no one else but the council to look after them, to look, look after the care and need and welfare. We cannot, we can't afford to let them down. And despite austerity and COVID chair, we have continued to support our residents and maintain the services that we provide. And in fact, increase these in many areas to meet these vulnerable residents needs and supported them throughout. And can you imagine the substantial increase that we have had over the last year and the cost of it? The nature and the complexities of these needs have also been increased and there's a greater impact on our resources. We have continued to support these people in their homes, in care homes, through the discharge from hospital. We provided equipment and undertaken adaptation to their homes as needed. 
we have a well-established and nationally recognized support accommodation for rough sleeper chair, which I'm sure everybody is aware of. We're maintaining our commitment to London way, living wage, and it is really pleasing to note this evening, as the mayor reported, that we're now an accredited London living wage borough. And that's a tremendous achievement during the difficult situation. And also, as uh, <coughs> Councillor Cole said, Chair, the public... We have 30 seconds, Councillor. Yes, I'll finish very quickly, Chair. We have the 50 steps, which we're working to make sure we address the health inequalities. Can I also say, Chair, that the 3% increase in council tax is ring-fenced to the social care services, and that can only be spent on those services. And these are the benefit of our residents to meet the challenges that we face, the expectations our residents have, and we want to make sure that we continue to support our vulnerable residents at this difficult time, and we do not let them down as this did government. Thank you, Chair. Any more, anybody else wants to speak? Any more members want to speak? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I just want to come in following on my colleagues and, and support the budget as well. Um, I think it's been made quite clear the difficulties that we have faced and indeed there have been problems across local government over the last 10 years in terms of the austerity that has been waged on local government and local neighbourhoods by this current Conservative government. And I think it would have been incredibly easy for us to row back and not to continue to invest in our services. And that's clearly not what we're doing. And we've prudent management to make sure that we can continue to invest in our residents and our neighbourhoods and our local services. And one of the things I wanted to highlight for um, councillors, for council and for residents watching is that we have been able to stick with some of the commitments we made in our earlier three year budget before the pandemic hit. And specifically, I know, and it's a concern, something that gets raised quite a lot and targets we have to face, that we've continued to go forward with our investment in recycling. We're in the process now of rolling out our commitment to ensure that all households in the borough have access to recycling facilities. And those blocks that were missed are now being uh, expanded to now. Um, this will be followed by our move to weekly recycling as we committed to uh, later this year. And in addition to that, at the same time, through negotiations with our waste contractors, we'll be expanding the range of materials that people will be able to recycle, including glass, pots, tubs and trays and aerosols. And so that's good news for the borough, good news for hitting our recycling targets, but good news in our continuing commitment to meeting what residents are asking us for in terms of services. And on the back of that, I would also like to draw people's attention uh, to Appendix C, specifically 2.11, and some good news in terms of what we've also been able to negotiate with the East London Waste Authority. For the year ahead, we have been able to negotiate to receive a one-off reduction. This has been agreed with the Waste Authority and our three partner um, boroughs as part of the East London Waste Authority that will reduce our levy for the year ahead. Um, and that will allow us to invest £5 million in the next 12 months in our public realm, in our streets, in our parks and in our neighbourhoods. And we'll be working with the councillors to identify neighbourhood priorities to make sure that those requests and those demands and those things that residents care about locally, we can start to meet. And so from my department, we'll be able to continue to invest in our, our public services, despite the constant attacks and constant pressure we will face from the government who pay lip service to it, but don't follow up with delivery. Thank you, Councillor James Hassan. Councillor Joshua Garfield. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in this virtual chamber in being almost in sheer disbelief that we're now a year on from when it appeared to be that the UK government chose to take the pandemic that was sweeping the world with some severity, at least that which it deserved the fact that we're even in a virtual chamber i suppose is evidence of how much the world has changed and when all of us were elected in 2018 it was on a promise and a platform and a manifesto of delivering real change for the people of this borough and yet a challenge has come along that none of us could have predicted none of us could knew that we were going to face and still I think that what this budget delivers for the people of Newham is that change, is that change that we were elected to 
deliver. And I think particular attention should be paid to what is being spent on ensuring that our commitment to uh, addressing the climate emergency is met, both in investments of transport facilities, of addressing health inequalities, and I'm particularly excited to see the investment in the Brighter Futures programme and everything to do with investing in our children and young people. These are commitments which I'm particularly proud that as a council we've been able to deliver despite the unprecedented challenge that we're now facing and having to plug a gap left by the government's decision not to fund local authorities properly throughout the pandemic and be under no illusion that despite or in spite of the challenges that we are facing our priorities remain unchanged from when we were elected and that is to deliver real change locally, principally for the people of this borough and ensure that we're doing everything in our power to make their lives better. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sugar. Uh, thank you, Chair, for letting me to speak. I'm supporting this budget. And I'm really congratulating for the government policy of the uh, administration in the last three years and their uh, extra funding for the SEN student and the young children. And I'm a, a father of a disabled child and I know how difficult it was for me to take him to the school every day. And because of their extra funding, uh, my son managed to get to school by the transportation in his final year. And I also, I can see that in front of my house, the new brand new road, there is no complaint from the my residents. And commitment to your air quality is commendable. Nobody can challenge it, your sincerity towards that, even though you failed to uh, challenge the London Mayor's project of Silver Tunnel project. And I also congratulate you for you, the London Living Ways, which had a tremendous impact on the poor borough and the poor people of this borough. And uh, I also congratulate you for your reshaping the Red Door Venture and investment in the uh, housing sector. And your continued commitment to the carpent house, which yet to be built, but I am sure you will do that. But the one thing is, I'm surprised to see that the only member of the previous administration, our finance portfolio holder, the council Terry Paul, why you don't share the magic you with, have the experience with the previous administration, which continued to zero based council tax, and yet they managed to invest 40 million pound on the the the, uh, the the football stadium, which uh, nothing to do with the poor borough, uh, people of this borough, but we managed to do the, all this last decade, even after the continued austerity measures imposed by the central government from 2010. And uh, that's the uh, point. Uh, I, might be you will say that that is the only option for you, but there are hundreds ways of doing things. If you look at the, how the Boris Johnson managed to this COVID-19, we all are disagree with this policy. He asked us to come out to eat out and spend, 40, spend 45 million pa billion pound on it and 500 billion pound on for the eat out alone. And yet he tried, he, he came out very shamefully the next month to find us people. If you come out of your house, step out of your door, we will find you. That was the drastic contrasting policy and because of his, uh, the Tuklukin reforms he implemented in this country and we are all of the victim of his uh, the idiotic uh, policy towards the COVID-19. So my it's point is that, minutes, Councilor Sugar. thank you Chair. My point is that, you know that when we need, our people need the more help from you and when we didn't, we got it in the last 10 years but this administration, particularly after doing all this good work, why we are not, why we are not uh, uh, 
give some respite to the uh, council tax increase and the parking charge at least uh, uh, overcome this uh, residents because of this pandemic. This is my criti uh, friendly criticism and I will understand you will accommodate this point of view from the people of uh, uh, our residents because we are receiving large number of emails from the residents. We cannot uh, hold it. The concern of the our residents. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Neil Wilson. Thank you. Just a second, I think Councillor. Oh, uh, does somebody want to move there to extend? <clears throat> Please, that's, that's, that's fine. Could I move that we extend the meeting by half an hour? Uh, any second? Thank you. Is that agreed? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I find out how much are we? Um, is it up to half past nine? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Councillor Neil Wilson. Thank you, Chair. I'll be very brief and my mind will consider that's the. Your <laughs> that, that the. Pardon? I said that's your usual phrase. You'll be brief. I will be very brief compared with other contributions yeah. and mine will be on the report that's in front of us. And it will, I will speak in the context of being a member of the Budget Working Party, but also um, somebody who is supporting this budget clearly. Just in relation to our recommendation nine about communications associated with the budget. And I note in passing that there are only about 16 or 17 people watching us. It's a shame that we can't actually, during this obstacle, with the pandemic, um, we've said it's a significant um, obstacle for resident engagement. I just want to make the point that Councillor Paul and I think Professor Marmot made about late decisions. The public health budget has still not been set, even though we're in the middle of a global pandemic. We are late running this council uh, council meeting because of the, the um, delays about the GLA budget. So, you know, we do need, I think, to actually make certain that we do have, even with the challenges of a pandemic, to try and keep putting pressure on central government. We have said repeatedly uh, throughout this meeting, they promised that they would give us adequate compensation. They haven't. I think this is a tremendous job that we've done by the people preparing this budget. And I want to second, um, you know, uh, Councillor Paul's comments on our officers and, and the hard work of a lot of people in the budget, but also to make certain that where there are delays, we rightly attack the delays on central government. We can't believe that in the middle of a pandemic, we still don't, don't have a figure for our public health budget. So I just wanted to put that out there, Chair, and also to say that, you know, the Budget Working Party I'm a member of, we, um, uh, along with Councillor McCormack, will continue to monitor this. And we do have now checks and balances in this council. And I speak as somebody on the audit committee, and that's, I think, a positive way forward as well. Thank you. Thank you for being brief, Councillor Neil Wilson. Councillor Daniel Blaney. Yeah, sorry, I didn't indicate to speak. I apologise. I was just, I, but I, since you called me, um, I'm probably looking up things. Um, oh, okay. sorry, we'll cancel That's okay. Again. I just Councillor. wanted. To, I just wanted to say that um, I think contrary to what was being said earlier, and I have been looking up my emails, I think the robustness of um, various councillors, including members of the administration, in opposing the Silvertown Tunnel is, is pretty obvious. And if any members want assistance, I'm looking through my emails now about some of the dialogue we've had with the GLA on it. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Councillor Daniel Blaney. Councillor Mutaz Khan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll also be brief. Um, I, I think it's been it's been a challenging uh, budget year for us, and I wish to congratulate uh, the budget um, committee for producing um, a very thorough report for us. And uh, uh, of course, we've had a previous discussion about um, some of the crucial and fundamental services that we need to uh, keep running, um, the adult social care. And I'm really pleased that we are investing in our young people because in 2018, when we came in to this new administration, um, they, there were a number of young people uh, that we lost through 
uh, knife crime and uh, uh, young uh, people through um, violence. And uh, I, I am so happy that we are able to uh, put the right sort of intervention to prevent young people from uh, getting into gangs and county line and uh, getting excluded from education. So I'm supporting this budget today. Okay, thank you. Councillor Rohit Dasgupta. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair, for allowing me to speak. I'll be very, very uh, brief. Um, I would like to congratulate uh, Councillor Terry Paul for presenting uh, this budget today. I think this is a budget of hope uh, and resilience. Um, as he rightly pointed out, you know, despite savage Tory cuts to the local government, um, the priority of this administration, as we see in this budget, has been to protect our frontline services and invest in the future of our young people, as uh, Councillor uh, Lee Fakwe uh, pointed out. COVID has devastated our communities, and despite all the assurance that we got uh, from this government to provide fair funding, uh, this never materialized. Um, and Newham, despite these challenges, will continue to have one of the lowest council taxes in London. Um, I think uh, looking at the report, you know, I think it's around 90 pence uh, for those in band C per week, um, uh, which is like 43% of our, our total properties. Um, so despite the challenges of COVID and government austerity that has been thrown at us, I see this budget as ambitious, ambitious to protect our service, uh, services, provide hardship support for our vulnerable uh, uh, communities and support for our small businesses. I'm proud that we've taken significant steps uh, to invest in our air quality and create a world beating uh, youth and children's services. Um, and also, you know, uh, we are protecting our libraries and community centers, uh, which unfortunately several of our uh, you know, other councils are having to make very difficult choices about. Um, and, I'm, I, and I must say that, you know, I'm, I'm glad uh, that this administration is not spending money uh, on vanity projects like the stadium. Uh, so I'm glad that that is not a part of this budget uh, as a, a previous um, uh, person mentioned. Uh, the future is still uncertain. Um, and at least in the medium term, we don't know what's gonna happen. Um, and it is good to see that the council will continue to monitor the situation um, and, and, and you know, change as uh, further activities is needed. Um, so for me, this budget is about the well-being and resilience, which is the very core of it. Uh, and I look forward to the positive impact uh, that's will, that it will bring to our residents in the years to come. Thanks a lot, Chair. Thank you, Steve, Councillor Stephen Brayshaw. Thank you, Chair, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Firstly, I'd like to commend this budget and thank Councillor Paul and Conrad and the team for the hard work that they put in to protect the residents of Newham against some of the most savage cuts, savage cuts that this council has had to endure from this Tory government for the last 10 years. I think one of the most despicable elements of their budget constraint has been when they promised to, to, to fully pay for everything we needed to do with regard to the COVID pandemic. And then within a few very short months of them, and they've still shortchanged us to the tune of a factor of about 20,000, I think that's right. I am so proud, so proud that we are putting food into our young people's mouths with our Eat for Free scheme and we're supporting our Eat for Free scheme and the fact that we are investing our young people to gain skills. Yeah, So that's a big piece that I'm proud of. Uh, Terry, uh, some things have been said about the previous administration and about how they invested money in the Olympic Stadium. I just wanted you to come back to me and let me know uh, what are we spending the, the return on that investment on and how much return have we had from that? For, I think it said 40 million, but my understanding was it was more to a factor of about 68 when it was finally finished. So I'd like to know what we're spending the investment returns on, please. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Anna Mizla. Chair, I waive my statement. You, you are not speaking again. Okay. No. Councillor Salim Patel. I think that's the last one I've got. Councillor Salim Patel. 
Thank you, Chair. Chair, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, Chair, I will be supporting the budget this evening, and I would like to welcome the London minimum wage included in this budget. It will be very much welcome in my ward, but sadly, is a friendly uh, criticism that uh, we are giving from one hand and we are taking away from one hand. It's sad to see the council tax rise in this budget and the emission charges. I know it's a very difficult time uh, despite all the cuts, but I think we should have looked thoroughly uh, and we should avoid the council tax rise and the uh, emission charges, but still I will be supporting the budget. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's it, I think. Huh? Councillor Moore. Councillor Winston Vaughan, do you want to speak? Thank you very much, Chair. Yes. Um, well, the Budget Working Party is not unlike the select committees that you find in Parliament. And the function of the Budget Working Party here in Neon is to scrutinise the Council's budget. Now, the Budget Working Party consists of a wealth of financial experience that sets out to work with the executive to provide better outcomes for the residents of the borough. Now, I'm a member of that Working Party, and I recognise the hard work that was put in to, to seek out the best outcomes for residents. Now, at times, there were differences between the respondents in terms of the cabinet member uh, for finance and also members of the budget working party. But it just goes to sort of passion in which we feel for the residents of Newham. All in all, I think, in spite of all of these, I think that the budget is a very welcome budget in the circumstances, and I'm sure it was supported by myself and the rest of the members of the council. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Council, is there anybody else? Yeah, Councillor Terry Paul. We have the right to last reply. Do you wish to say anything further? Yes, I, I do, Chair. And before, I, there are a couple of things I want to say. First of all, I want to, I think Councillor Sugar said, um, can I, what's the secret of my magic? I think, I think that's what he said. Um, what I will say to him, my magic will be used for the residents of Newham. I, 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 I say no more than that, but thank you for your kind comments on my and my finance team's ability. Uh, on the bit on Silvertown Tunnel, Councillor Daniel Blaney has made this attentive point. And I know that because I was in the room with the mayor and other cabinet members as we drafted the, the, uh, the letter to Sadiq Khan and I was there in the mayor's office when she sent, she pressed the send button to Sadiq Khan. So, Can I correct the misunderstanding about my comment, please? Oh, sorry. No, I, I, I was it about my magic. Okay, sorry. I'll I, I take that back. <laughs> okay. And um, I, I said, the, uh, why don't you share the skill you earned from the previous administration to this administration? Okay. All right. Okay. Um, and, and the other bit, on the Olympic Stadium, I think Councillor so we are against the Silvertown Tunnel and let nobody say anything else. On the Olympic Stadium, Councillor Brasher was absolutely right. It was about 67 million pounds and it wasn't our greatest um, investment. I, I'll leave it as that. And my role is to focus on the future and not the past, okay? So I'll leave it as that. Um, I want to go back to my main comments about the Budget Working Party. Can I thank Councillor McCormick and the rest of the Budget Working Party as Councillor Vaughan said, there were, we spent a lot of time with each other over the last winter, right? And there was some really good um, debates, and I thank you. I, I, I thank you for a consensus budget. I thank you for that. I thank you for the way we conducted the process, actually. I think Councillor Vaughan summed it up. We actually care about our residents, and whatever constructive um, argy-bargy we have is to, is to get the right policy out and to argue our way. And I think that's the spirit of the Budget Working Party. I want to thank you on that. I want to thank um, Councillor Cormann and the Chair for actually setting out some of the challenges which we have. And you are absolutely correct. Slippage, risks, you know, we've got to meet our savings, we've got to repack our reserves. Absolutely correct. Okay. And, and I think you laid it out well. And also about us 
continuing to make those savings to balance the budget and set some of those challenges. So can I thank um, the committee for their work? It is a good piece of work. And just to, for residents watching tonight, um, when the, the budget, even since the budget working part of response has been published, myself and Conrad, who's the finance director, has met with, with the budget working party to go over in detail and just to iron out some of the, the you know, so, so what the committee wants. And I think that's a measure of, look, sort of the trust and respect we have in the committee. But even we've met you already, we've, we've got ways of working. I'm not going to steal your funder, Tony, what you want to do going forward. But we're, we're, we're doing that in a moment. So can I thank you for your um, for report and thank you for the constructive measures. I think if I can chair, I think the mayor might want to add some concluding remarks to what I said. <laughs> If that's through you, Chair, at your at your behest. Chair, Chair, mm -hmm. there's no facility for anything. Uh, like there's that. no facility for that. Okay. Even Councillor Aisha Chambi has uh, put her hand up after you have spoken, so I can't allow it either. I respect the authority of the Chair. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move to the vote. As this is a decision on the setting of the Council budget and Council tax. A recorded vote must be undertaken. I will ask the monitoring officer to carry out the vote. Okay, I will, as, as you're familiar, I'll read out your name. Please answer for, against, or abstain. And hopefully I'll miss out the people who aren't present. Um, Mayor Roxana Fias. For. Councillor Hanif Abdul Mohid. For. Councillor Nazir Ahmed. For. Councillor Zulfikar Ali. For, Chair. Councillor James Assa. For. Councillor Jennifer Bailey. For. Councillor James Beckles. For. Councillor Daniel Blaney. For. Councillor Steve Brayshaw. For. Councillor Aisha Chowdhury. For. Councillor Ken Clark. For. Councillor Dr. Rohit Dasgupta. For. Councillor Sasha Dasgupta. Councillor Sasha Dasgupta. <laughs> I'll move on. Councillor Mariam Dode. For. Councillor Cannon Anista. For. <clears throat> Councillor Amana Gangadharan. For. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Councillor Joshua Garfield. For. Councillor John Gray. For. Councillor Alan Griffiths. For. Councillor Belgica Kawana. Yeah, for. Thank you. Councillor Zuba Gulamusen. Joy, can you scroll? Councillor Zuba Gulamusa. Can you just mute our microphones, please? All right, I'll move on. Councillor Patricia Holland from the telephone. Oh. Councillor Lester Hudson. Oh. Councillor Animal Islam. For. Oh. Councillor Nilufa Jahan. For. Oh. Councillor Maniba Khan. For. Oh. Councillor Mumtaz Khan. For. Oh. Councillor Jen Kitchen. For. Oh. Councillor Joy Laguda. For. Oh. Councillor Carleen Lee Parkway. For. Oh. Councillor Daniel Lee Parkway. For. Oh. Councillor Jane Lofthouse. Oh. Councillor Pushpa Makwana. Oh. Councillor Susan Masters. Oh. 
Ang swag at may makaabot. Or Councilor Shelby McLean. Oh. Councilor Ria Ahmed Mirza. Oh. Councilor Perosa Nekawala. Oh. Councilor Narissa Osai. Oh. Councilor Mas. Councilor Mas Patel. Uh, four. Councillor Salim Patel. Four. Councillor Terry Paul. Four. Councillor Reverend Quintin Pepiat. Four. Councillor Mah Mohammed Muzabir Rahman. Four. Councillor Tamina Rahman. Four. Councillor Sarah Ruiz. Four. Councillor Aisha Sadika. Four. Councillor Sh Sugar Thekapuria. Four. Councillor Delphine Tahura. Four. Four. Councillor Winston Vaughan. Four. Councillor Havinda Singh Verdi. For the budget. Councillor John Whitworth. Four. And Councillor Neil Wilson. Four. Actually, just go through his back. Oh, so I'll return. Back. Leave you minutes to me. Hi. So, so Councillor Sasha Daskupta, four against or abstain? Four. Thank you. Right. I, He's not right. No, so motion is current, yeah? Chair, you can declare the motion. Okay. It's all the, so, the budget is carried. Oh, the budget is carried. Thank you, everybody. Item 17, approval of sorry. Item 17, approval of 2021-2022 members allowance scheme. Mayor Fias, Fias, please make, move the recommendation in the report to have up to five minutes. Please. Um, thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to be inviting, if I may, through the chair, the monitoring officer, to go through some of the detail. But in essence, colleagues, this is a annual report that has to come to full council in line with uh, the legal requirements that um, every single council is subject to. And it's in essence setting the members' allowances for each uh, municipal year. And it ordinarily comes on the same month as the budget paper uh, in order for it to be taken into account. And I just really wanted to draw everyone's attention to uh, the section 3.2 of the report, which um, notes that the uh, local government pay settlement presently is not known as yet uh, so any qualifying increase in line with the legal requirement uh, will be applied in year so at that juncture back um, through the chair if I may invite the monitoring officer to say any additional words thank you very much madam chair thank you madam mayor uh, monitoring officer please have you got something to I, say I have nothing to add oh yes nothing to add so, do you have a seconder, please? Do I have a seconder? Yes, Chair. Oh, where is the second? Oh, Councillor Carlin, the parkway. Thank you. I have nothing to add. Okay, thank you. We now move to the debate. To the debate. Does any member wish to speak? Many, many, many more. No. No, thank you. Uh, Mayor Fiat, do you have anything else to say after no debates? Um, no, thank you, um, Chair. Um, if we okay. can move straight to the vote. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. We now move to the vote. In a few moments, for those joining us on the Zoom, the voting options of four against to abstain will appear on your screen. You have 30 seconds to vote. Mr. Mekinah, do we have any members currently joined by telephone? Uh, 
Councillor Holland is on the line. Sorry? Councillor Holland. Holland is on the line. Oh, but Councillor Holland, why do you vote? Councillor Holland, can you hear me? Councillor Holland? She said yes before the issue. Oh. Oh, thank you. Uh, Four fifty two. Nobody against the no abstentions. The vote, the motion has been carried. Thank you very much. Item 18. Treasury Management Strategy Statement 2021-2022 and Treasury Management, Management Annual Investment Strategy 2021-2022. Councillor Flow, I'm sorry. Councillor Paul, please move the recommendation in the report. You have to up to five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Um, and for members of the public and um, members here at full council, this is about a, 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 an actual demonstration of us, of, of accountability and transparency. You might hear us keep mentioning SITFA, which is the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy Code. It, it's, it's the governing body for local authority finance. And what this is in front of you is us being transparent and showing good governance in what we do in your name, you know exactly what we do. And what this, this is a report, it sets out our strategy and how we're going to do it. And it also complies with the government guidance and the potential code. And you might think this is a dry document, but actually, no, it's not actually. It's about us demonstrating fair governance, good governance, and what we do in your name is, is, is the right thing, what we do. And also what it does, it, it provides you information about those underlying assumptions which you will use in using aspects of our balance sheet. You know, what we think about the indicators, interest rates, credit worthiness going forward. And it's one of those documents when it just sets out there for, for, um, for transparency and accountancy and accountability sorry and transparency what we do going forward and these reports set out there are statutory reports yes and what we will do is bring them to you to show what we're doing thank you chair i have no further comments do i have a second please yes chair i'll second uh, do you have anything to say I will very be very, very brief, if we please pleased to hear, because time is pushing on and Councillor Paul has said it all, but I would just like to say I think that it's often easy for these kind of reports to be overlooked or, or regarded as rather dry and technical, but as Councillor Paul has said, these are extremely important in terms of ensuring transparency and good governance and proper financial control. A lot of um, what we talk about, a lot of what goes interest is the, the front end stuff, the things people see on their streets, things people see in their homes and delivery, but ensuring that works well and works effectively means a lot of work behind the scenes in delivering reports and delivering uh, proper controls like this and it fits in with the wider agenda we've been doing to try and make sure things work properly um, to ensure that people understand that their taxes are probably being spent and can look at them and understand what is being done this kind of work are the foundations on which running a good council is built and running a good council to make sure we deliver those frontline services so i commend this to the council thank you councillor Asa. we now move to the debate does any member wish to speak i've got councillor levis i was saying thank you chair 
Um, I just wanted to say that I think this is a really important report and I think, you know, in future I'd hope we'd have more time to discuss this because as Councillor Aston points out, it's basically the basis of which we run the council. And obviously we've got a statutory duty to comment on how much we can borrow and we've just passed the budget. Um, and obviously it's important that we make sure our budget plan to meet our policy needs. But I think, you know, we as councillors have a, more of a responsibility more than ever to be mindful of um, these statutory requirements, you know, when we come up with policy ideas to ensure we're adhering to this framework. So I, I would urge all councillors and, you know, members of the public who are interested to read this document in full, because I think with the financial constraints we have going forward, it's more important now than ever that we use this as a basis when we're trying to come up with policies going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Osei. Councillor Neil Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Um, paragraph four, um, well, I've got it in front of me, sorry, 457 rightly refers to all rescheduling of anything will be carried out in consultation with the Mayor and Cabinet and will be formally reported to the Audit Committee as well as Cabinet and full Council. So I share my the previous speaker's comments and Councillor Asser and Councillor Paul's comments about how this administration is very open. I just want to say that we've benefited, I think, both the chair and my colleagues on Budget Working Party for having somebody from SIPA as an external sort of voice on that Budget Working Party progress um, process. We have external chair to the Audit Committee and we have um, outside people sitting on that. And I think the more that we can actually make certain, particularly in the political context in which we find ourselves, for us to be open and transparent, even in these difficult times, I think it's very important that we emphasise that in a public meeting such as this. So I commend the comments of Councillor Sai as well, that we should study this in great detail if we're not on any of those committees either, because that's the way that we make good policy arising out of our budgetary processes. Thank you. Councillor Jeff Speckles. Thank you, Chair. I just want to commend Councillor Paul and his team for producing this report. I think financial literacy is a very important area, and I think it's something that all councillors should make the effort to read through, um, if not all the technical aspects, but at least the headlines. Mm. Um, having gone through quite a bit of training provided by um, Councillor Paul and his team, which I thank him for, it was very insightful. I think it's important that all councillors make the effort to go through this and understand how our finances are managed, where finances come from, and actually how the council operates from the back office. Not everything that we do is actually seen, and it's a Herculean effort by um, Councillor Paul and his team to make sure the budgets stack up and we have proper investments. It's accountable, it's transparent, and it's there for residents to see. Thank you. Councillor Paul, you have the last reply. Do you wish to say anything further? No, Chair. I think my colleagues have, have, have said it all, but, you know, especially, you know, about... Okay. The Thank, Thank you. you. We now move to the vote. In a few moments, for those joining us on Zoom, the voting options of four, against or abstain will appear on your screen. You have 30 seconds to vote. Mr May, can I ask you... Do we have any members currently joined by telephone? Uh, Councillor Pat Holland. Yes, four for me. Thank you. Your task, Councillor Holland. Councillor Holland. Councillor Holland. Four. Yeah, four. Yes, okay, four. Thank you. Thank you. It's 51 for the motion has been carried. Thank you very much. Item 19. Are there any appointments made by the mayor which she wishes to announce? No, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, are there any appointments which are which are either the chief whip or the deputy chief whip wish to propose? 
Islam to propose. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to propose that both independent person to Standards Advisory Committee, Christina um, Asare, and Deputy Independent Person to Standards Advisory Committee, Paul Tour, um, to have the statutory position extended for a year until the 1st of March 2022. Do I have a second up? You do, myself. Jane, love to us. Okay, thank you. Do you want to speak or are you okay? No, thank you. Oh, thank you. Is that a great? Can I show of hands? Is that a great? Thank you very much. This concludes the business for this evening. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Happy St. David's Day to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.